Did you vote for the bank bailout? Did you vote for the cabinet of a new president? Did you vote for the tax increase? Do you vote for where highways or power grids or any infrastructure goes? Did you vote for the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq? No, you didn't. So where is your real participation? In part three, we'll discuss how a true democracy actually would work, and it's not the election of people, it's the election of ideas. We have to understand that government as we know it today is not in place for the well-being of the public, but rather for the perpetuation of their establishment and their power, just like every other institution within a monetary system. Government is a monetary invention for the sake of economic and social control, and its methods are based on self-preservation first and foremost. All a government can really do is create laws to compensate for an inherent lack of integrity in the social order. It's also worth pointing out that most politicians, in fact, are lawyers. Most players in government come from the world of law. And in reality, they have absolutely no real education, therefore, or understanding about the true foundation of social operation. Can a lawyer come fix your home heating system? Can a lawyer go and organize a power grid for a particular area? No. Lawyers and hence politicians are simply not trained in any tangible way to solve real problems. They're trained to solve artificial, nonsensical problems that are culminated byproducts of our nonsensical society. In other words, society is in fact a technical creation. I'll say that again. Society is a technical creation consisting of infrastructure, resources, and management. Society is a technological construct. Republican, Democrat, it doesn't mean a damn thing. If you really want to see a society that works, you have to begin to realize that science and technology is the overarching element that governs the entire mechanism of social organization. And therefore, those who study those attributes should be given not control, but should be given the forefront of participation, forefront of influence to say, hey, you know, we can feed and clothe all the impoverished people in Africa and in the third world. We could technically do it. But unfortunately, they go to their corporate bureaucracy, and hence government bureaucracy, and of course the governments say, oh, we don't have the money for that. The question has never been, do we have the money? The question has always been, do we have the resources and technological know-how? Now, the final issue I would like to cover in this section <clears throat> has to do with activism and the traditional patterns of activism we have seen historically across the world. In the world today, there are countless well-intentioned people and activist organizations making a lot of noise about the rampant problems and injustices in our world. Yet, unfortunately, as you tend to find, very few offer any real tangible long-term solutions. Those that do offer solutions, however, almost universally frame those solutions within the pre-existing social establishment. Their tactics tend to involve new legislation and of course, they always demand ethics and accountability. Very little regard is given to the root structure of our system. Battling and protesting corporate organizations, corrupt corporate organizations, and seeking money from society in an attempt to curtail such trends is a typical path that is taken. It is a very respectable path in general. However, it is not going to create long-term change. I'm nothing but pleased to see something like this but does that really do anything? When it comes to social corruption, poverty, environmental disregard, human exploitation, and most personal and social turmoil in the world today, the great realization is that most of these problems are not the result of a particular company, some nefarious elite group, or some government legislation. These are symptoms of the foundational problem. The real issue is human behavior, and human behavior is largely created and reinforced by the social patterns required for survival as necessitated by the social system of that period in time. We are products of our society, and the fact of the matter is, it is the very foundation of our socioeconomic system and hence our environmental condition, which has created the sick cultural climate you see around you. Very rarely do any activist organizations today consider the possibility that maybe it is the social system itself that is the problem. 
The bottom line is that we can spend the rest of our existences attempting to stomp on the ants that mysteriously wander out from underneath our refrigerator, setting traps or laws, or we can get rid of the spoiled food behind it, which is causing the infestation to begin with.